Welcome to Beyond the Headlines. This is Spiro Rondos for Concordia University. I would like to welcome Paul Srivastava, David O'Brien Distinguished Professor at the John Molson School of Business. He is also Director of the David O'Brien Center for Sustainable Enterprise. The center guides organizations in developing holistic, sustainable strategies rooted in innovation and enterprise development. Paul Srivastava has a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh and was a tenured professor at the Stern School of Business of New York University. He has founded or co-founded several prominent businesses and institutes in North America and India and authored 15 books and over 100 scholarly articles. A former Fulbright scholar, he is widely consulted by major publications for his insights on business, sustainability, and industrial crises. In conversation with Paul Srivastava, we have Stephen Kibsey, the Vice President of Equity Risk Management at the Case de Depot at Placement, Quebec. The Case is one of Canada's leading institutional fund managers, serving public and private pension and insurance plans. It has over $150 billion in assets. Stephen Kibsey has worked at the Case for over 12 years. He has degrees in physiology and engineering, an MBA from Concordia, and CFA designation. He sits on many industry and stakeholder boards and was voted Top Gun Portfolio Manager in Brendan Wood surveys in 2008, 2009, and 2010. Stephen Kibsey's interest in sustainability began in high school when he was awarded the Youth Science Foundation's Man and His Environment Scholarship to the University of Guelph. Welcome to you both. Uh, let me begin with you, Professor Srivastava. I'd like to ask you uh, about your own journey to sustainability, uh, how you came to these insights, and specifically, how does academic research support the kind of work that Stephen Kibsey does? So I started my professional career as an engineer, and I was very enamored with what the benefits technology can bring to us. Uh, I was teaching at NYU at that time, and a major technological disaster occurred in the town that I had grown up in, Bhopal. And that made me question the downside of technology, and I started doing research on industrial and technological crises. And from there, the discussion around the world was around environmental crises, which were also somehow prompted by industrial and technological processes. So that's how I got introduced to sustainability. And I realized that in the business field, in the management disciplines, there was very little work and very few conceptual frameworks to understand this downside of technology. So I started doing some research. I created an organization called Organizations in the Natural Environment, which now has about 1,500 members, which are business professors who are studying environmental impacts and sustainability issues as they relate to businesses. Uh, since the mid-1990s, there's a lot of interest among academic researchers in the area of business sustainability because sustainability is no longer a do-good, tree-hugging kind of concept. It is becoming the core logic of profitability for business firms. Companies that know how to use ecological efficiencies can actually become more competitive and they can attract uh, more customers and brand loyalty, as well as better employees. So I think sustainability now fits into the business logic, so it is becoming accepted widely among business researchers. Uh, would you agree, Stephen Kibsey? Is it, is it becoming less and less of an ethical thing and uh, becoming more self-interest? Uh, definitely. Um, you can look at a lot of uh, mainstream investors now are uh, integrating uh, the ESG factors into their evaluations uh, when they're trying to make an investment. Sorry so, to interrupt, ESG is? Is environment, social responsibility, and governance, okay. um, as well as geopolitical risks. So a lot of investors are looking at the risks uh, that could uh, uh, Im impact their investments, and uh, they're discounting that into their investment thesis. So though the financial community has been very good, at calculating intrinsic values in mathematical models. Uh, there's the other part of the equation, which is the softer qualitative side. And uh, we've seen over the years, they're integrating more and more of those factors in their evaluations. And I think, Stephen, you would agree that uh, 
It's not uniform across businesses. Some are leading, like KS Depot has put in a lot of emphasis on it. But there are still some in the old model, the old paradigm, if you will. Yeah, uh, it, uh, you know, th there's always an evolution with this uh, type of uh, process. Um, I, I would say, you know, we've already gone through an evolution in the equity markets where at one time um, the typical investor was retail and then uh, over time it became more institutionalized uh, with pension funds and mutual funds. Uh, and then maybe more recently, uh, the latest faction to join is uh, hedge funds. And uh, uh, there was a time when day trading was a, a very yeah. big thing, and it still, it still is. Uh, so some people have a very short-term approach, and they may not uh, need to really apply the so-called ESG factors to their analysis. Uh, but the longer-term players, uh, like ourselves, that are mainstream, uh, have to look at these factors when we make our uh, long-term uh, evaluations. Mm -hmm. Is, is policy, I, mean, I know that the case has a with the policy on responsible investment, uh, is that critical for uh, investors to have the policy? Uh, yes, it is, uh, because um, uh, though uh, a lot of, uh, of the work is really done by uh, the analysts and the portfolio managers, uh, that is sort of like the front line, um, and they uh, do integrate all these factors as much as possible into their investment thesis. But you do need um, uh, direction from the top. Uh, of course, um, we also get uh, direction uh, from our depositors who ask for us to get uh, a good return with the money that uh, we have to manage for them. Uh, but they also want us to consider uh, the uh, ESG factors uh, as, we do, uh, as we do our investing. So uh, it's important that uh, the case as an organization, uh, the so-called you know, uh, um, higher um, uh, management, uh, helps put in a framework uh, that makes it uh, easy for the portfolio managers to uh, get the information that they need, uh, to be able to process the information, and uh, then to uh, work with that information in terms of their uh, investment philosophy. Is there a role for university to play in this, either through, as I said earlier, a research or how you uh, educate uh, graduates? Managers. Yeah, yeah. so I think uh, companies are looking for clarity about the relationship between social, environmental issues and financial performance. Historically, and back in the 1970s and 80s, there was this kind of conflict that if you were green or if you were social, then it was coming out of your profitability. So there was like a, a conflict in yeah. understanding. And I think uh, research has uh, clarified that relationship a lot more over the last 20 years and shown that, uh, first of all, uh, social and environmental costs don't necessarily have to be only on the cost side, that they can actually generate new revenues by attracting people who have that kind of value set. Uh, they've also shown that there's a correlation between profitability, financial profitability, and social and ecological performance. <clears throat> of course, we need more studies to validate it under different industry conditions and under different circumstances. But I think uh, there's a lot of research that has provided the confidence that business managers need, that this is not just a a ethical issue, it is a investment issue, it's a real financial issue. Uh, we at uh, Concordia University are uh, focusing on this kind of research within the David O'Brien Center, but also more broadly within John Molson School of Business, so that we can understand all the connections in marketing, in operations, in finance, in accounting, in information systems, to these efforts to move towards social and ecological responsibility. I think one of the things is that uh, uh, over time, um, um, all the uh, portfolio managers uh, obviously uh, know a lot about finance, and uh, they've been educated in, in finance. Um, and then sustainability has been evolving over time. So a lot of professionals get at a time in their career where they basically have to sort of go back to school to learn what sustainability is. And some, it's difficult because they're kind of stuck. Uh, they don't know exactly what sustainability is. Um, they 
got you know quite a lot far along the career without uh, 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 using the, these factors in their analysis. Uh, but now they, they want to know more about sustainability and they don't know where to start. And uh, one of the best places to start is obviously the universities have done a lot of work over time, whether it's research or education programs. And um, the, the, the thing is just to how do you link up the professionals with the academics so you can have this transfer of knowledge so you can get the uh, professionals sort of uh, up, to, uh, up to the point where uh, sustainability has evolved. And uh, it's tough for a lot of professionals because uh, they're already busy with a lot of things in their daily life uh, so, uh, and with their work, and, but they need some kind of program uh, that they can um, learn and move ahead. Um, and uh, that's what we've been developing uh, and working with, uh, with Paul on uh, over almost a year now to try to develop something to help the professionals. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's been a good working relationship because you are right in the sense that uh, professionals need to know what's been going on in terms of sustainability concept development. But on the other side, academics need to know what are the challenges facing real managers in real work situations? And I think that's where our partnership really has had the most uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. That we learn from you as a professional and, and the group of managers that we interact with, uh, what are the real needs? Rather than going in our uh, sort of ivory tower and developing a program, this particular program that we have worked together, the Sustainable Investment Professional Certification Program, is really, a, I see it as a joint effort, a sort of partnership with uh, members of the corporate community. And what we've be, been able to do is to uh, create uh, a business advisory council. And uh, in, that, uh, in that group, uh, we have uh, businesses, uh, some uh, actual uh, uh, money managers, uh, as well as uh, some financial institutions. Um, and what we've been able to do is sit around the table with Paul and able to give him feedback as to what we need to know. And also there's things that he's able to bring to the table that we weren't aware of. We said, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> this is what we need to know. So how far can you take us in this? How, how can you educate us more in this? And uh, how can we then use this in, in our own work? Uh, so uh, I, I think the, the mixing of the two uh, is really going to help the professional and the academics to, to go forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it, the partnership goes beyond just the content development. I think uh, uh, any of these programs require money, funding, mm -hmm. and uh, the business community has been very forthcoming, thanks to Stephen's leadership, to find the right resources and get the right kind of partners around the table. Mm -hmm. So that's been another part of our engagement. And uh, then finally getting these, uh, what I think of as, as the cues for what will work. Now, we don't understand exactly how limited time these professionals have, why it is important to have a self-learning program, a self-paced program, but by talking to people in the professions, uh, those everyday realities become sort of design points for us in the program. So I think we've learned a lot with regard to how to design a program that would work for professionals. It's not a program designed to sit people in the classroom and lecture at them. It's a program to yeah. get people to appreciate sustainability concepts in real life and then apply them to real life projects. And has there been a uh, response from the investment community or, I don't know, en enrollment or interest? Uh? Well, we now have a pilot project that is uh, up and running and uh, we do have a, a pretty good group uh, to start off with. And, and maybe what I'll just add right here is that um, the, the fact that uh, we can do it without going in a classroom is really important because uh, I can just take an example from my own life over the last few weeks. I've been traveling through Mongolia and China. There's no way I could get to the classroom, yet I had all the materials I needed. And what was really interesting is that as I read the materials uh, in preparation of the first module, uh, as I was traveling, I was able to immediately look and assess things with that information that I was able to get from the course. So it's a kind of a classroom out in, in, in the world rather than in a you know, physical classroom with desks and a, and a blackboard. So, uh, and, and that's, you know, that, 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 that's what the professional needs because if you're out there in the field and you have that information with you, uh, you can learn a lot quicker and uh, you can even use it right in your uh, professional assessments uh, right away. And, and, and so it's, it's value added and, and you contribute to your work like immediately. 
Uh, I was wondering, sustainability, is it, is it some, we assume it has some kind of universal meaning because of, uh, I guess, mass media, but you know, you invoked Bhopal a moment ago, you talked about you were in Mongolia. Uh, does sustainability mean anything in those societies? Is, does it have the same value? Uh, are, are, we, are we imposing Western views on those societies? Yeah. Well, I think sustainability to me is a global concept. Uh, it might have different manifestations uh, depending on the country and the culture and the economic stage that that country is in. Uh, so the sustainability challenges in places like China or Mongolia or India are different than sustainability challenges over here. But we have only one Earth. We have only one atmosphere to deal with. And we all have to try to draw lessons from what it would take for these human societies to flourish for a long period of time, not for a three month period that an analyst looks at it, not at the annual period that managers typically look at it, but in the long evolutionary time scale. And so to me, it's a collective concept. It needs different kind of actions from different parts. We in the West are over consuming. We need to cut back our consumption. There's no question about it. You can't tell the same thing to a person in Africa or in an impoverished part of India or in Mongolia. Uh, they, on the other hand, need to think about alternative ways of developing and developing a lifestyle that is not like ours. So I think the challenges are different, but the concept applies around the globe. And I actually feel that you cannot have sustainability unless everybody joins in. But they will join in in different ways. I think sometimes we're surprised where we travel around the world, and it's not necessarily uh, the Western culture that has imposed it, but uh, you'll find in other places that they've discovered something which we can use, uh, you know, something mm -hmm. that's uh, interesting towards sustainability. Um, so I, I would not uh, uh, put it in the context that, uh, that it's just a Western uh, imposition uh, of this. Uh, and, and I think, I think they, they, they embrace the, uh, uh, the concept of sustainability because they know it'll make their businesses better. And if they can start off now with a better business and, 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 and including sustainability uh, in what they're doing, um, they won't go through those hard lessons that uh, we have to go through. Uh, I mean, it's so much better to have prevention, let's say, for example, in environmental issues, than to go back and try to fix it later. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of places in North America where we have to go back and fix things now because we didn't really uh, apply uh, sustainable uh, principles uh, when we first started uh, certain businesses or certain operations. Um, I note uh, in, uh, that the case uses discussion and persuasion rather than sanctions uh, when dealing with businesses, evaluating businesses as mm -hmm. uh, investments. Uh, how has that worked out for you? Actually, it's worked very well. Um, over, over the years, uh, the case has uh, always made sure that whenever there was an issue uh, dealing with uh, uh, environment or social responsibility or governance, uh, that uh, we'd uh, sit down with the uh, management of the company, uh, make sure that uh, they would understand uh, our point of view. Uh, we'd also uh, offer to them possible solutions, give them the time to think about it, uh, have discussions with them. Uh, Often uh, some of these issues come up in the uh, proxies and uh, in, uh, what we try to do is uh, help them out uh, in the way that uh, we may not have to go to the point where uh, we vote against management. In fact, uh, before the vote even comes up, uh, they can maybe find ways of uh, finding a solution to the issue and uh, we will also talk to other stakeholders and shareholders and uh, we can come to a solution uh, b before uh, they, they have to uh, have a, a vote uh, that goes against uh, what they're trying to do. So, so we, we can fix things a ahead of time uh, through discussion. I, 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 a more general question, are you optimistic uh, given the trajectory of uh, world events and business? Uh, are you optimistic for the future? Well, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, clearly, uh, there are, I would like the world to move much faster, particularly on large topics like climate change. It's very, very frustrating. 
that uh, despite all the scientific evidence and consensus around the world, that uh, national leaderships, including ours in Canada, are not rising to the occasion of uh, creating a treaty that would actually help mitigate the problem. Since 1990, when we first agreed on a 350 parts per million cap uh, uh, for carbon, the numbers have actually gotten worse <laughs> every year for the last 20 years. So yes, I'm, uh, I'm impatient. On the other hand, uh, I don't see that this is a problem that is unmanageable. The Stern Commission report back in 2006 very clearly stated that if the global GDP, if we just took one and a half percent of the global GDP and applied it to environmental problems and climate change problems, we would be able to save almost 20 percent loss of economic productivity. So I think there's a very strong economic case out there. Uh, we need a leadership that will recognize that and, and, then, and not think only in national terms but think in global mm -hmm. governance terms. What would it take to create a global commons that will sustain and survive and endure? So yeah, I'm optimistic, but I also realize that there are big challenges out there. Can I ask you to reflect on the same question? Yeah, I, I'm actually quite optimistic because uh, I've seen, especially over the last five years, uh, a lot of progress, uh, especially uh, on the investment side, to, uh, to, to, to look at the elements of sustainability. and. Uh, uh, a lot of companies uh, are progressing. Uh, things that maybe they wouldn't have done five or ten years ago, they're now doing today, uh, looking longer term. Uh, they, they look beyond just the monetary gain uh, in the short term. And uh, um, I, the companies, uh, you know, a, a lot of them uh, want to make sure that uh, they do make the world a, a better place. Um, they do have uh, their, uh, their mission. And uh, if they can uh, include sustainability in that, and, and most of them can, um, they know they're going to make the world a better place for everybody. So th there, there's no real intent to, 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 to do things wrong. Nobody wants to. Uh, there was probably mistakes done in the past. But I think with, uh, with better education, uh, better processes, um, the companies are able to uh, apply sustainability principles um, in, a, in a more um, in, in a more rigorous manner, and uh, but but I'm very optimistic because I I, I see a lot of signs of uh, uh, of uh, things. Uh, I mean, we we can go back to uh, to things that were uh, unfortunate, such as uh, what happened in the Gulf of Mexico with with with, uh, with BP. Uh, but uh, the reaction of, of the government, the reaction of uh, uh, of the company, of, uh, of, of other companies too, to try to avoid those things that, that could happen in the future. Um, you know, they, they, they've taken it to, to, to heart and they will try to, uh, to do things. And we, we can see that. But it takes, it takes time. It's not immediate, but it takes time. They, 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 they will try to do more and more things to avoid these kind of situations. Well, on these uh, cautiously optimistic notes, I would like to thank you, Paul Srivastava and Stephen Kibzi, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.